I'm so happy to be with y'all today. Our scripture for today comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Hear God's word for us today. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We have previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else. Even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thank you, God. Do I need to do anything with my microphone? Just keep going. Okay. <laughs> All right. If you need to switch out something, just let me know. Well, in case you are joining us for the first time today or you need a refresher, we are in the middle of a series of road trips with Paul. We've been traveling with him as he visits and writes letters to newly forming Christian communities in order to teach, encourage, and challenge them to allow the gospel to shape every aspect of their lives. And so as we roll down the windows on this road trip, I hope that the fresh wind of God's spirit will come through to help us better understand not only what life was like for these early Christians, but maybe we'll find some new clarity and passion for living out our own faith as well. So let's pray. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Today, we pick up with Paul during his second road trip or missionary journey. He's taken the exit for Corinth and has decided to stay a while. In between making new friends, shout out to Priscilla and Aquila, and setting up his pop-up shop, shop selling the tents that he makes, watch out, REI, Paul writes a letter to the Christian community at Thessalonica. Thessalonica was prime real estate for the Mediterranean world of that day. It was right on the Via Ignatia, which was the major land route between east and west. Perfect positioning for anybody and everybody just trying to make a living. So the people of Thessalonica were predominantly Greeks, but there was a steady flow of immigrants coming in from all over the world to make Thessalonica their new home. So the city was really becoming a mashup of cultures, languages, foods, philosophies. Paul and his friends Silas and Timothy had road tripped to Thessalonica recently. And if we look in Acts chapter 17, we hear a little about their experiences there. How the Christian community that formed began with just a handful of Jews, quite a few God-fearing Greeks, and several predominant women in the city. At some point, though, the Jewish community got a little jealous of the traction that these new Christians were getting, so much so that they ended up whipping up a mob and dragging some of these new Christians before the city leaders, shouting at them accusingly, these people are turning the world upside down. Wow, did you catch that? There's something about the way that they are sharing the gospel, something about the way that they are living life together that is turning the world upside down. This was no polite, contained, culturally acceptable way to spend a Sunday morning. This was shocking, transforming the very fabric of society, the very order of the world. And some people found that inspiring. 
while others found it threatening. Well, Paul and his friends continued their road trip so they could plant and encourage more Christians in other cities, but Paul could not forget this community in Thessalonica. So when he heard that they were struggling against some opposition, people in the city who were trying to disunify, distract, and discourage them, he decided it was time to write them a letter. So he did, to remind them what it really means to be the church and how to embody the gospel. Embody the gospel. Gospel is such a churchy word, isn't it? We say it a lot, don't we? But what do we really mean by it? What is the gospel? Well, the Greeks used the word gospel to describe news of victory in battle. A messenger would come, face shining, spear decked with laurel, head crowned, swinging palm branches wildly, calling out the good news of victory for everyone in the city to hear. For the rabbinic Jews, when they referred to gospel, what they meant was to refer to the variations of a musical theme throughout the part of the story of scripture that we call the Old Testament. The gospel telling of the one true God who created us in God's image, who gave us free will to choose how we would live in the lives that God has given us, The God who wants nothing more than for us to choose to be in covenant relationship with him and who will stop at nothing to make that relationship possible and lasting. In the New Testament, gospel is used to refer to the good news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, teaches and embodies. The gospel in the New Testament is proclaimed by missionaries and musicians, by financiers and fishermen, by angels and thieves, by pregnant women and the poor. It is everywhere at work. Jesus shows us that it is for all people. It gives new life. It heals, it restores trust. It offers connection, relationship, and belonging. It blesses those who are poor, those who are hungry, and those who mourn. The gospel brings hope. It rescues, liberates, and sets things right. It is entirely unique. It feels like the tight embrace and extravagant welcome home after a long time away. It sounds like the quiet calm after a storm. It smells like a newborn lying in a feeding trough. It tastes like fresh baked bread. It looks like a group of tenacious toddlers clamoring to climb onto Jesus' lap. The gospel is good news that is meant to infuse every fiber of our being, to resound to the depths of our soul. The gospel is Jesus Christ, God with us, in it all, for us all, for love of us all. And as Paul reminds the Thessalonians in our passage today, we are to share it. Share it. We share the gospel with courage in God. Courage in God. The part of the phrase is critical, in God, because Paul is not trying to give us a pop culture reference to the Wizard of Oz. Nor is he trying to give us a mildly interesting TED Talk to take in on our drive to work and then promptly forget. No, Paul is reminding us here where our courage comes from, or rather who it is rooted in for every context we find ourselves in. For Christians in the world who have for the past 2,000 years battled intense persecution, courage may look one way. But for us who live in America, for us living in Texas today, it may look a little different. 
courage in God may look like a willingness to remain non-defensive when criticized on our core truths. It may look like an ability to listen with a gracious and generous spirit with those whom we disagree with. It may look like a tenacity in advocating for those who do not have a voice. It may look like a willingness to work alongside those who are new to us or those who are different than us. We share the gospel with courage in God. We share the gospel from a motivation to please God. Paul says in verse 4, Pleasing God, though, what does that mean? (laughs) How do we please God? Well, when Jesus was baptized, there was that voice from heaven. Remember it? And it said to Jesus, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Before he did any miracles, before he taught any parables, before he calmed storms or fed thousands, before he healed the sick and restored people to community, before he forgave sins or went to the cross, God called Jesus beloved. God told Jesus, with you, I am well pleased. So it wasn't about what Jesus did. It was about who he was and is. And that same thing is true for me and you today too. God is pleased with you, not for what you do, but for who you are. And so our desire to share the gospel comes out of this motivation to live into the pleasure that we bring God and our desire that everyone will come to know their identity and worth as God's beloved people. We share the gospel from a motivation to please God. We share the gospel with integrity. An integrity that comes as we allow God to keep working on us every day. Paul talks about this in verses 4 and 5 in terms of God testing our hearts and God being a witness to Paul's motives. In the 1500s, St. Ignatius of Loyola developed an intentional way of making space for us to bring ourselves before God, for God to examine us. And we call that the daily examen. And the basic idea is that at the end of each day, we sit down for a few minutes and we review the events of our day. We take an honest look in our heads and our hearts. We thank God for the good moments And we ask God for help in recognizing the moments that were hard, painful, confusing, or where we were just plain wrong. And we bring that before God and we ask for God's help to work through the hard and confusing stuff with us, for God's healing for the painful parts, for God's forgiveness and grace for the moments where we sin, where we missed the mark. And for God's wisdom to make different choices tomorrow. No matter how little or how long we've been in relationship with Jesus, we're daily in need of this rhythm of confession, repentance, and receiving of God's forgiveness, love, and grace. Practices like the daily examen keep us truly humble And very much aware that as we share the gospel, we're doing so from the same playing field as everybody else. We are all sinners in need of a savior. And our integrity plays a really important part in whether people will believe the gospel we're sharing. And whether we'll believe that it's real and that it really is good news. We share the gospel in integrity. We share the gospel in relationship. Paul says it this way in verse 7. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. We cared for you. 
Paul uses a really rare Greek word here to describe a kind of caring that comes out of an intense longing, a feeling of being drawn to something or someone else. So the imagery that Paul is using here of a nursing mother caring for her children offers us some insight into the tenderness and vulnerability involved when we share the gospel in relationship. This tenderness is not coercive, but it comes alongside. It is not manipulative. It's invitational. It's not judgmental. It's compassionate. It's not flashy. It's raw. And this vulnerability is what enables us to be real about the ways that we are constantly stumbling and growing on this journey of life and faith. And in case this metaphor of a nursing mother isn't relatable for us, or we've just simply brushed past it, Paul makes the same point again in verse 8. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. When we tap into this, we're tapping into the heart of God, who out of a deep caring that intensely longs for us and is drawn to us, sent Jesus, his only son, to be Emmanuel, God with us through it all. We make that sound general sometimes, I think, but Jesus shared life in really concrete ways, like around the dinner table and at a wedding reception, by a graveside and at a well, on the beach and in the mountains. He taught us about God's kingdom by telling a bunch of stories. He engaged people in conversation wherever they were, on hikes and fishing trips during road trips and snack breaks, in the middle of a work day and on the edge of desperation, listening to and sharing in conversation with everything from anxiety to joy, grief to healing, doubt to faith, ostracization to belonging. When one of the religious leaders asked Jesus about what the most important commandment was, you remember how he answered. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and your neighbor is yourself. Apparently, loving God, ourselves, and our neighbor involves every aspect of our lives. Just as God is with us in every moment of our lives, So God calls us to share life with people in ways that point to God's presence with them in every moment of their life too. So that call is to show up on the ball field and in the hospital room, on the pickleball court and in the courtroom, at the dinner table and in the carpool line, in the online gaming platform and at the HOA meeting in the struggle with infertility, and in the grappling with getting older, in the never-ending cycle of meal prepping, planning, and cooking, and in the struggle with chronic pain, on the playground and in the nursing home, in the loneliness and in the codependency, in person and via text message. There's a line of our United Methodist liturgies for baptism where parents or guardians of children or those who are unable to answer for themselves vow that they will, quote, live before these children or persons a life that reveals the gospel. A life that reveals the gospel. I became a Christian in part because there were people in my life who shared life with me in ways that revealed the gospel. By that I mean in ways that made it real, 
personal and transformative. I continue to be a Christian today. I continue to be a part of the church today in part because there are people in my life who share life with me in real ways that keep reminding, inspiring, and challenging me to come back, come back to the God who calls me beloved, come back to the God who longs to share every part of life with me, come back to the God who invites me to share life with those who have never heard and those who have forgotten those who have become turned off to faith by the hypocrisy they've seen, and those who are longing to cultivate a long obedience in the same direction. Those who have longed for a safe space to wrestle with honest questions they have, and those battling to get through the day with anxiety and depression. Those who feel worthless, unseen, and unheard, and those who feel they don't deserve love. Those who are struggling just to get through today, and those who are rushing ahead already thinking about next week's plans. Those who are going through the motions of faith out of obligation, and those unsure how to live in the tension of their doubts and their faith those who are too busy to think, and those who think the gospel isn't true. In verse 4, Paul reminds us that God has entrusted the gospel to us. And so, with courage in God, with a motivation to live out of God's pleasure in who we are, by allowing God to continually work within us, cultivating a gentleness and a vulnerability in all aspects of relationship, we will share this gospel, this grounding of our faith, this expression of our hope, this source of our joy, this good news that God is always with us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for reminding us what the gospel is all about and for inviting and for challenging us to share this good news by sharing life with those around us. We are in awe that you would trust us with this incredible privilege. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear your presence with us in every moment. And fill us, God, with your unique blend of empowerment, of courage, accountability, tenderness, and vulnerability, so that we will live lives that reveal the gospel. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.